LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and I'll just begin today by saying that if you've ever felt like making a donation to support my work, now would be a good time to do so. You can do so at the website, LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com. You can spell Legalize with an S or a Z. You'll find a donate button on the homepage. If you don't wish to use PayPal, go to the contact page, drop me an email, and I'm sure we can sort something else out. Okay, today's guest is Mark Vidler, and he joins us to discuss the book Sacred Geometry of the Earth, The Ancient Matrix of Monuments and Mountains. From continent to continent across the globe, Mark Fiddler and Catherine Young reveal that order is everywhere on Earth. On remote islands, soaring summits and level deltas, they unveil natural topographic patterns related to pi, the golden ratio and right angle geometry. And as the planet's design emerges, it becomes clear that this hidden order in nature decided the location of ancient monuments the world over. Through detailed maps, Vidler and Young show how the locations of megalithic monuments reflect and enhance a natural pattern on the Earth that connects its major features. The authors examine the geography of many islands and each continent, including Antarctica, to show how the highest peak on each landmass falls on a line connecting coastal extremes. They reveal how circles of standing stones mark intersections of these lines. They explore the connection between the Nazca lines in Peru and the Amazon, Nile and Ganges deltas and explain how the locations of the Giza pyramids, Stonehenge and Machu Picchu are integrated into the natural design on Earth. As they uncover geometric patterns line by line, point by point, they reveal how the world's ancient monuments represent a form of trans-global communication that far predates the written word. Perhaps the biggest mystery in all of this, however, is how, in ages before flight, satellites and Google Earth, ancient peoples could have had a truly global picture of the Earth that we today are still rediscovering. Hello and welcome, Mark, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Today, Mark, we're going to be talking about uh, your new book, which you've uh, co-authored with Catherine Young, and that's uh, just come out. It's uh, entitled Sacred Geometry of the Earth, the Ancient Matrix of Monuments and Mountains. Uh, before we get into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your background and your work in general. Um, well, this work actually in this book uh, proceeds from my first book, which I, I wrote uh, alone, uh, called The Star Mirror, um, which was uh, published nearly 20 years ago now. Um, and in The Star Mirror, uh, I found what I believe is... Um, a, a pattern um, uh, relating to the ancient monuments and the celestial sphere. Uh, in brief, the star mirror uh, concludes that the arrival of Polaris, the pole star, over the pole of the Earth, uh, was um, considered as an auspicious time in the ancient world, um, and that their monuments were in some ways uh, arranged to reflect the sky uh, at this auspicious time in history, which is, in fact, the present day or the next um, 100, 150 years uh, of um, a few stellar epochs when Polaris is uh, most nearly over the pole of the Earth. Uh, that was uh, the star mirror in essence. But during that, writing that book, um, uh, I recognized a relationship between the stars and the highest mountains on the Earth. And this seemed to... Um, uh, be connected to the hermetic expression, what is above is like what is below. And I began to wonder if uh, there were 
uh, patterns in the stars which were reflected by the mountains uh, on Earth. Um, and that led on to this book, The Sacred Geometry of the Earth, which I've uh, co-authored with uh, Catherine Young. Now, there's some pretty mind-blowing uh, implications and possibilities that extend from that potential relationship that you've just mentioned. We will be getting to that. To get us started, give us maybe the uh, little overview of the new book and then maybe start us off with some examples of ancient sites that are relevant here. Because, uh, you know, in the early part of the book in particular, you're kind of moving from, from one to another, uh, you know, documenting various interesting features and, and importantly, commonalities, similarities between these sites. Yes, um, we found uh, similarities in the uh, location of um, ancient monuments in the UK, uh, uh, specifically to start with, um, as such that the uh, I could give an example of uh, Avebury um, is aligned between um, uh, high points and with high points uh, in such a way that the uh, highest point in the south of England uh, aligns with the highest point in the Chilterns on a line that passes uh, through Avebury. Um, the highest point in central southern England and the highest point in southeast England, that is Walbury Hill and Leith Hill, are on a straight line with Silbury Hill at Avebury. And given the, the prominence of these high points, um, it seemed more than coincidental that uh, the monument was in the crosshairs of lines joining these four uh, very dominant high points in the uh, landscape of southern England. That led to uh, further investigation of monuments in general, only to find that very, very similar alignments occur with uh, other large um, monuments such as Stonehenge, um, Stanton Drew, and um, many others. We, we went into some detail in Cornwall, where we investigated uh, the great majority of circles in Cornwall, and found that the, the, there is a common denominator regarding how these uh, monuments are located. In other words, we believe that the, monu the location of the monument uh, was a crit of critical importance uh, to the people who placed it there, and it reflects a topographical geometry. So what period of time, obviously you've mentioned a few sites there, even lay people coming to this with very little knowledge, they will have heard of Stonehenge, they'll know something about that. I mean, can we say there's a period of time that we're talking about here, for example, because in the book you move globally to look at, uh, consider various sites, and some of these are thousands of years apart, it seems, as far as we know. So how would you characterize the, you know, the time period we're talking about here in general, if, if we can do that? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because the, uh, the process, for instance, of uh, building pyramids uh, began um, uh, way back with the ziggurats um, uh, and uh, the pyramids of Egypt and uh, uh, continued right the way through to uh, pyramids being built in Cambodia at Angkor uh, in 1000 AD. So we're talking about a, a huge span of time where pyramids and um, uh, monuments with high points, essentially, uh, were being built. And uh, it's my belief that this uh, was uh, a form of understanding that permeated the ancient world and right the way through to um, more recent times, an understanding that um, uh, high points uh, on the earth are in uh, geometric patterns. And uh, it's these patterns which the monument builders uh, were using their high points and their monument stone circles are included. They were, uh, uh, stone circles are essentially geometric points in this uh, uh, topographical geometry. And the, the, this understanding uh, extended over uh, many thousands of years um, amongst perhaps an elite uh, uh, a group of, um, of sages, if you like, or seers even, um, and that these people had uh, uh, an understanding of the topography of the Earth in terms of uh, a geometric construct. Um, and this is reflected in, in um, the uh, most ancient um, documents and uh, religious texts 
uh, where the general consensus is that the earth is ordered, is a word that we re repeatedly used, it, the earth is ordered in some way, in some often uh, considered to be a divine way, um, and that it is this order which I believe the monument builders were uh, attempting to um, bring down to earth, to, um, uh, to describe by placing their monuments in uh, these uh, crucial focal points uh, on the planet. For a lot of people, this is, there's something in what you've just been saying that's kind of a whoa, hang on a minute type moment with the, you know, this idea of an ordered earth. I'm reminded actually a few years ago, I read a book which at the time in itself was several years old. It was called Who Built the Moon? And that was by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler. At least one of those gets mentioned in your book yeah. as, as people doing uh, interesting and potentially very important research. And they were drawing attention to a lot of uh, numerical patterns, shall we say, in the earth uh, that seem to correlate and correspond somehow with the heavens. So we can't really say, if we're talking about, about purpose, about design, about meaning here. There's a limit to where we can go because we just don't know. But what's your feeling on this when you've, you've looked at this and you seem to be discerning evidence that, of, of not randomness? If I can, if I can use that uh, rather clumsy phrase, you know, what, what, what is your, what's, what's your gut saying to you that so far, given that this is an ongoing research project yeah well uh, in the present day we 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 have a view that the um the globe the, the the map of the earth as we as we see it is essentially uh something random uh something uh that's just been created by folding faulting volcanicity plate tectonics and so on uh and consequently must be um a random result um on the other hand, if we look back to the ancient world, this was not the belief uh, of the ancient world. And it was, um, it, it's my contention that the ancient world actually had evidence, uh, to support their view that the earth is ordered. Um, but that evidence, um, uh, was, uh, was mastered or un understood, um, in an esoteric way, um, uh, and, uh, and in a way that I I can't understand myself how uh, these um, uh, how this understanding could have been achieved in in uh, ancient times. However, if you look in modern times at the where the ancient monuments are, um, there are far too many alignments with uh, high points uh, and monuments uh, to uh, make this coincidental. So. We have a feeling that they were surveying the Earth in some way. We're not quite sure uh, how they were doing this because there's no evidence of tools to suggest they were surveying with theodolites or anything like that. However, um, the alignments of the monuments uh, is is uh, is almost um, uh, well. It is essentially predictable. It's, uh, it, it's it occurs to about ninety percent of the monuments we looked at in the south south of England. Um, such that the alignment of Avery that I've just mentioned is not unusual at all. Um, indeed, you, um, I've just uh, been through the Silbury Hill, the Marlborough Mound, and the Hatfield Barrow, which are three closely, um, uh, the, they're in close proximity to each other, these very large Neolithic mounds. Um, and they all uh, perform in the same way. They're all aligned between high points such that they are in the crosshairs of lines joining uh, uh, four high points, essentially in pairs. Uh, so um, you you join, um, as I say, with, with Avery, you, you join High Wilhays, which is the highest point in southern England, to uh, Hatfield Hill, the highest point in the Chilterns, and that line goes through Avery. Likewise with Leith Hill and Walbury Hill, the same line goes through Avery. Uh, we get, uh, uh, I, I won't go on because the... Um, the, the topography of southern England is, isn't something that's known known about generally in any great detail. Uh, but if you get to know the topography of southern England in more detail, uh, you find these same high points being used by other monuments um, uh, in, in terms of alignment with uh, high points, such that they're in the crosshairs. Now, the interesting point is that when you get... Um, all these high points um, uh, on the map, and they, they, they repeat. They repeat in terms of uh, alignments with uh, various monuments. 
when you use these high points themselves, they themselves appear to be geometrically arranged. So, uh, for example, um, we've, we've mentioned High Wilhays, we've mentioned um, Leith Hill and Haddington Hill. These form an isosceles triangle. Now, this geometry between high points is, is something that you can see with modern technology on Google Earth using Google Earth's measuring tools. And this provides what I believe is a revelation about um, the topography of the planet because it does not appear to be um, entirely random. Uh, there appears to be some kind of organic um, structure to it which gives it a recognizably geometric form. This, this is, I agree, is very way out there. Um, but I fall back again on the ancient world that said that this was the case, in, you know, several thousand years ago. Uh, it's been, of course, that view has been poo-pooed and it's been ignored and ridiculed even uh, for um, uh, several hundred, if not thousand years. Um, but if you look at the um, evidence for the geometric arrangement, as we do in the sacred geometry of the Earth, uh, if you look for this um, evidence, it is everywhere. Um, there, there is uh, a consistency about uh, the way the high points and the extreme points uh, in the topography of the Earth are, are arranged. I, I don't think most people would have difficulty in accepting that there's, you know, order in the universe. I mean, we see in nature patterns and they're not like the hard edged sort of 90 degree aspects of, you know, of the man made world. But, you know, we see, we, we do see order and patterns uh, within sort of the natural order. Uh, you know, we think of crystals, for example, and snowflakes and all these just amazing things that nature seems to do that, that look like they're, they're, they're constructed, look like they're built, if you see what I mean. But yes. it, it, it just seems like, like like such a leap, doesn't it, really, intellectually or conceptually, just to go then to in something that ostensibly appears so random. You know, uh, the untrained eye can wander around a landscape or even a man-made site, you know, one of these monumental sites, and not see what is there, if you see what I mean. Because I think in many ways, you know, we don't know what we're looking for, which, of course, one of the things that you're doing is, you know, this is why we're having this conversation. You've spent time here, and it's like... When you do look then, you know, over a period of time and you maybe change your perspective or throw out some of the uh, preconceptions that, you know, we all bring to these things, then, you know, the, these things can take on a very different aspect. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think uh, modern technology is, uh, in, in this case, in the form of um, Sky Maps and uh, Google Earth, uh, are giving us a view uh, which was uh, impossible in my own lifetime. Uh, I started studying this before Google Earth came out, and I was, um, uh, it was very, very difficult to establish exact distances between, um, uh, you know, hundreds of points on the globe, uh, because each one had to be entered into a computer with its full coordinates, uh, and this takes, uh, this takes a considerable amount of time. Uh, along come Google Earth, and um, all of a sudden, um, you've got the facility to measure from A to B anywhere on the planet at the click of a mouse. Uh, this accelerated the whole process uh, enormously, and uh, indeed, w without that um, facility, um, this book wouldn't have been possible. Um, what it does show, though, is uh, that there are some um, very... Uh, intriguing relationships um, between uh, uh, the extreme points on the Earth. And I say extreme points, I mean uh, what I say, the, the four corners of the Earth. And I mean by that the northern, southern, eastern, and western extremes of a landmass. These are the four corners of the Earth, as I understand it, uh, as mentioned by numerous uh, ancient um, peoples. Uh, the four corners of the Earth refer to the landmass itself, not, nothing to do with the globe, um, because this then makes sense that what we're looking at is extreme topographical points. And it's these corners, when combined with uh, the high points, that produce the geometry. And it's um, quite uh, um, revealing when... Uh, you look at, uh, say, island, uh, uh, an island or islands, 
and their topographical extreme points in relation to the highest point on the island. Um, you, you tend to find the extremes are aligned uh, with the high point um, in some 25 to 30 percent of cases. Um, this extends then to alignment between the high point and two adjacent extreme points. Uh, these, th these details are given in the book um, and uh, indeed there are 50 uh, high points, the, the, the 50 highest points on islands in the world. Um, I've uh, produced a, a website with these uh, lines on them, uh, neolithiconline.com. It just shows the 50 highest mountains and their relationship to uh, the extreme points uh, on the island and adjacent islands and demonstrates essentially that there, there appears to be something formulaic about the relationship between high points and extreme points on land masses. Now this is, you know, a huge surprise um, to uh, to me certainly, but it becomes predictable. And when something becomes predictable, you know that you have a pattern. Um, and so there appears to be pattern on the Earth, which again is what the ancient world suggested. How do we factor in long-term changes in the Earth? Uh, now, these tend to take place over very long periods of time that are out of the uh, the, the usual sort of human experience. But, you know, the, the land masses have moved and shifted. The sea levels have fallen and risen. Uh, with regard to the the patterns, uh, you know, the, the numbers that you've come up with, what kind of effect or relevance does the, does the, the shifting of the Earth over long periods of time have on any of that? Yeah, well, it, it, exactly, and uh, this is where I came in initially with the um, uh, celestial sphere. Is um, it? It sounds uh, way, way out there, I know, uh, but um, I do believe the um, relationships that we're talking about with land masses uh, in the present day uh, were known about in the distant past, whether or not uh, the extreme points were at that location at the time. There's, there's considerable evidence that the extreme points are essentially geometric points in a, in, in a geometry that can be recognized uh, whether the extremes are there or not. In other words, as Polaris comes over the pole of the Earth, we get an integration, uh, a, a, a formulaic, a, a, a apparently formulaic, um, uh, creation on the Earth itself. Now, how long uh, this lasts and uh, whether it's permanent or not, uh, it's impossible to say um, because the, as you say, over very long periods of time, uh, we're, we're, these landmass points uh, will move in relation to each other. The reason that I'm uh, quite sure that the uh, that the these extremes were recognized in the distant past is that we get repeated alignments uh, in the UK for instance to the land the tip of Land's End um, through the monument alignments uh, to the northern extreme of the landmass uh, done at head um, uh, we get repeated alignments to the same points uh, um, and these uh, these lines intersect at Land's End at Dunnet Head and so on uh, the Dingle Peninsula is, is another notable one. Um, and so the monument builders are referencing a geometry which is manifest today. Uh, whether it was manifest uh, uh, at the time, say, um, uh, say some uh, 2500 BC, uh, is um, a, a mute point. We certainly know the uh, coastline on the... Um, uh, eastern side of the UK has has altered quite considerably in that time uh, along the Norfolk coast and so on. Uh, nevertheless, Avebury is currently, currently in the present day, aligned between the eastern and the western extremes of England, between Land's End and Ness Point uh, on the uh, east side and Land's End on the west side. Straight line drawn between those two extreme points passes through Avebury. The most interesting thing is it passes also over the highest point in southern England. In other words, the landmass extremes, as I mentioned earlier, are lining up with the high points. Okay, just a, again, a layman's 
point I'm throwing in here. This might be not relevant. It might betray my ignorance, but is the curvature of the Earth of any relevance here when it comes to drawing lines uh, from one point to another on the Earth? Oh, yes. Um, I, I, when I say a straight line on the Earth, I'm, I mean a great circle. The, the, a great circle is referred to as a straight line uh, when you're... Uh, it seems like a contradiction. But when we're talking about straight lines on the Earth in terms of um, bearings and, um, uh, say, flying an aeroplane in a straight line from A to B, uh, it will follow what's called a great circle. Um, so all the when I say there's a straight line between this and that, I, I'm talking about a line that follows a great circle over the uh, surface of the Earth. Yeah, I didn't want us to end up in the flat Earth uh, brigade. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. These these things can uh, anyone who reads the book can 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 follow these things on Google Earth, uh, which draws straight lines as great circles um, from A to B on on the planet. And when you, when you do this, you you make some. Uh, there are some uh, repeatedly remarkable uh, alignments uh, uh, that operate on a local scale, as, as I say, with um, small land masses, but are also found on a continental scale, such that uh, a line between the southern part, or the southern extreme, rather, of Africa and the northern extreme of Africa will continue uh, in a straight line following a great circle uh, to the northern extreme of America. So we get three continental extreme points in on a single line and extend this line further and it goes to the highest point in North America, Mount McKinley. So we have three continental corners, if you like, aligning with the continental high point or the northern continental high point in this case. The, these, uh, the, these mountains and extreme points uh, are referenced by alignment uh, repeatedly by the ancient monuments. So we we, we understand that what they're doing is pointing to these uh, these aligned points. Uh, all we have to do is join them together, essentially, to see the geometric arrangement. Well, you mentioned uh, you know how important Google Earth uh, was to you as a tool. I mean, we can only wonder really how this knowledge, this understanding that you've referred to uh, amongst ancient peoples, could ever have been arrived at. You know, how do you? I mean, first of all, there's the you have to then accept that global travel actually happened in the ancient world, if I can just use that general term, um, yeah. for some of these periods of time. You know, the, a popular perception is, you know, that 1492, Columbus goes to America, and, you know, that's it's it's all very limited prior to that sort of, you know, to the Middle Ages or whatever, but it, there's lots of evidence suggesting that there's been travel all over the globe at different times, but it keeps getting pushed back in time, the idea that people were moving around all over the place. But even given that, it's then just sort of without the benefit of, as far as we know, without the benefit of being able to see things from the sky, so to speak, how any of this could have been done is, is just is mind-boggling. Yes, uh, Catherine and I uh, both had uh, a lot of trouble with this because we'd virtually written the book and we realised that uh, uh, it was going to be very difficult to believe <laughs> because we still find it difficult to believe. However... If you look for it um, uh, on Google Earth, uh, it's, it, the evidence is, is there uh, to be seen. Um, the most, dis the, the most uh, extraordinary uh, aspect of this is, is that the measurements um, uh, along these lines uh, keep referencing pi and phi digits when they are measured in nautical miles. Uh, the nautical mile is, is uh, recognized as uh, using a sexagesimal system, which is the ancient world system of dividing the circle into 360 degrees. Um, so we, uh, we've got these, uh, the, this ancient method of, of dividing the Earth up, which is uh, the, the one we still use on Google Earth to give degrees and bearings. Um, and the nautical mile um, is the mean distance of one arc minute on the uh, meridian. So uh, the nautical mile is essentially um, a unit of measure uh, that was uh, developed through the 360 degree 
circle, which is the ancient division um, uh, of uh, of a circle. Uh, I've I've probably uh, rather lost uh, lost the listener there. What I'm what I'm saying is that um, when we measure, for instance, the um, the, the line we were talking about earlier that goes from the southern tip of Africa to the northern tip of Africa and onto the northern extreme of America, the distance between the northern extreme of America and the northern extreme of Africa is 3142 nautical miles, 3142. Those are the pi, the pi digits in nautical miles. Uh, this is not just a one-off. This um, happens again from the northern extreme of Africa to the northern extreme of Asia at um, Komsomolets. Um, so we get an isosceles triangle with legs measuring 3142 nautical miles joining the three continental northern extreme points, that is Ward Hunt Island, Komsomolets, and uh, Cape Angela at the northern extreme of Africa. This is a huge isosceles triangle um, joining the continental corners um, uh, uh, between Africa, Asia, and America. This is not something we were uh, uh, led to expect in, in, in geography at all. Um, consequently, we were liable to uh, just dismiss it and say, well, yeah, there's a coincidence for you. But these coincidences persist as you measure uh, the extreme points around the world. You mentioned the pi and, and phi figures there, and it's at this stage that I remember back to the much hated mathematics class at school and uh, learning about the significance of pi. And uh, of course, right at this moment, it would probably be useful for me if I could remember what the significance of pi is, but I can't remember. <laughs> so I just remember we had pi and it's like uh, we were taught what it was and where it came from. But um, at this stage, that escapes me. I don't know if you could throw any light on that. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the circle ratio. Um, in, in the same way as the phi ratio is the um, 1 to 1, 6, 1, 8 um, uh, ratio of a line, the so-called golden section. The, these are, the, these are um, just mathematical ratios in terms of uh, phi describes the circle, uh, 2 pi r or, or 1 pi d. Uh, what, if you multiply the diameter of the circle um, by 3.142, you get the circumference. It's amazing, isn't it, when you, I mean, so many interviews I've done concerning, uh, you know, these sorts of topics, but also lots of other uh, scientific topics. Again and again, n numbers are coming up and e increasingly emerging, uh, not as a, a man-made thing, not as artificial, but somehow that mathematics is not only sort of like coming from nature, but it almost is underlying reality in some way. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This shouldn't really be a shock, this sort of thing, because, um, uh, as you say, exactly, uh, you, you see these patterns in the Nautilus shell, you see them in the um, Andromeda galaxy. Uh, we see geometric pattern, and uh, uh, the, the, these are, these are uh, in nature. The surprise is actually just finding it uh, in uh, on the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that's something we we wouldn't expect. Whereas we we're not at all surprised to find it on the surface of a leaf. Uh, it's a conceptual uh, jump, but as I, once again, as I say, it's one the ancient world took long before we retracted uh, uh, from that view. I think we retracted from it because it just sounded wholly uh, ridiculous. Um, and uh, in uh, the present day, we're we're allowed to see that it isn't uh, as ridiculous as we were led to believe. Well, again, uh, this has come up in multiple interviews that I've done. Anytime you uh, invoke the word design with regard to whether it's a cosmos or life on Earth or somewhere in between, it's not much of a leap for uh, detractors to go to intelligent design and from then to the God Squad and it all becomes theological and pseudo-spiritual and you, you just get lost there. And, and so I think that's people resist it for that reason. I see this a lot in people, some of whom are, you know, people that I know and I converse on these topics uh, with them very often. Uh, they, they resist anything to do with patterns, design, anything that could be anything other than accidental because they see it as a slippery slope into, you know, at the very least pseudoscience, but at worst religion. And that's a bit unfortunate because, we, you know, we need to be able to consider these things outside of those categories. 
Yes, I, I, it's well to remember that Copernicus was pseudoscience uh, at, at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I the the the, the, the sort of pseudo ap, uh, application. I'd, I'd be the first to say yes. By modern standards, this is pseudoscience. Um, it, it it's not something to be scared of. Most um, uh, the recognition of most uh, things comes uh, with resistance. Um, uh, be, uh, if they're changing a paradigm, uh, the paradigm takes um, uh, takes uh, decades, if not centuries, uh, to alter. And we're currently in a very sort of hard nose, hard edge um, uh, society, Western society, scientific uh, society, um, where the scientific method is God, and um, the idea that there's anything outside and beyond the scientific method that might actually be called God is um, is an anathema. Uh, so, um, it, yeah, uh, you you get uh, I I have it too. You get you you get an awful lot of uh, uh, raised eyebrows and um, d dismissive uh, gestures, as it were. Um, because you're asking people to uh, uh, look at something they've already made their minds up about. Mm -hmm. uh, however, what my point is that, that we've made our minds up about the Earth and its uh, lack of any geometric order without ever having looked at it. <laughs> you know, we didn't, when this decision was made, um, I mean, uh, say, post Newton, um, that, that, um, uh, we mentioned Lyle in the book, his his great book on on geology, describing the Earth and and the sudden shock with the realization that it was millions of years old and so on. Um, this threw uh, a great spanner in the works of, of of people who'd been saying that it was in some way divinely or, or organized or um, uh, any sort of thought of divine um, uh, pattern uh, went uh, w went fairly rapidly into the bin. But at the same time, when Lyle wrote his book and when Newton was uh, uh, thinking on these things, uh, they couldn't see the Earth. They, they you know, maps were uh, were um, inadequate, um, and uh, it it wasn't until the use of a, a digital spherical map uh, that you can really see and measure the Earth properly. I mean, any flat map uh, creates a problem um, because. Uh, uh, because of the the impossibility of, of presenting a circle on a flat surface um, a, a, with um, accuracy, uh, so we we made all these decisions about how uh, what a lot of numbskulls the ancient world were for believing this stuff. But we made it without the ability to uh, um, to find the uh, to to show the evidence uh, of their. Um, misunderstanding. It was an assumption. And um, in my view, it was, it was a wrong assumption, and one that's been stuck with ever since. Um, uh, and it will probably take uh, um, several decades now, if not more, for, for generally for people to uh, start to make these measurements and realize that there is um, an underlying um, form uh, which is repeated uh, around the Earth. I've made this point before, but in many ways, the Big Bang and Let There Be Light, I mean, what's the difference between those two? You know, I've often thought they sound surprisingly similar. Creation ex nihilo, if you take it scientific or you take it from a religious perspective, it's the same thing. Just as a comment on, you know, people's perspectives and how if we, for example, choose, as, as individuals, if we choose to oppose religion, we should be careful not to become too religious in our opposition, if you see what I mean. Uh, it's a bit like the idea also of the extreme left wing and the extreme right wing. They just go so far out that they meet. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I find, I find a lot of those uh, ideas are, are, there's a lot of relevance for that when it comes to scientific debates about what is and what isn't and rejection of religion. You see a lot of commonalities actually between individuals that seem to be poles apart and actually they're equally dogmatic. Yes, but, absolutely. And I agree entirely. We shouldn't, we, we shouldn't go down the fanatical route. Um, we, we can see the, the dangers of that in the, pre in the present day world. And incidentally, the, the book, The Sacred Geometry of the Earth, is not about religion. It, in fact, the word sacred is the only time it appears is on the cover. Um, we're not, we're, we're not plugging 
a, a, a religious view. Uh, not at all. You can take this uh, as you want. Any, any, any more than if I described a nautilus shell in detail and the Fibonacci sequence that it describes, that I, uh, that I say this is a manifestation of God. No, it's a manifestation of the nautilus shell. Uh, but likewise, we've got a manifestation of the planet itself. So um, we're, we're talking about nature, um, uh, how uh, nature comes uh, uh, comes to uh, develop these patterns is is another issue. You may believe the Nautilus shell is divinely um, inspired. Uh, alternative, you may think it's the process of uh, a natural selection and so on. Um, it, you you may think that the planet is divinely inspired. Um, uh, and you may think this because there is evidence of pattern uh, on it. Uh, which appears to be calculated. Um, now, I mentioned the figures earlier. Um, uh, it's my belief that the ancient world picked up on the 360-degree circle. After all, they could have chosen another number. Uh, but they picked up on the 360-degree circle because this circle, uh, the, this uh, division of the um, circle of the Earth, of the meridian of the Earth, because this division uh, yields these pi and phi digits um, when you use... Uh, the nautical mile as a measure, and it was it it, it was uh, that that gave um, uh, that in my view gave the original inspiration to divide the circle into three hundred and sixty. I know that is actually way out there because there's no evidence to uh, support what I've said, but there's no evidence to support any other uh, reasoning for the division of the circle into three hundred and sixty. Um, uh, I believe, other than the rather tentative one about the number of days in a year, which are not 360, as you know. Well, I mean, I mentioned snowflakes earlier. If anybody wants to consider or meditate upon patterns in nature, go to Google or your preferred search engine and, and stick snowflakes into the image search and just go and look at some of those in detail. Uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And if that's all a random accident, so be it. It's still amazing whether it's <laughs> whether it is or not. To comment on something that you mentioned a few minutes ago, we do have this arrogant idea about those that came before us, particularly peoples who uh, existed so far back in time that we we really know next to nothing about them. Uh, particularly if they didn't have writing and anyone didn't leave those sorts of records, a lot of the assumptions are that these were primitive people, they were simple, and then by implication somehow that they weren't that bright. Uh, even if we look at some of their achievements, Stonehenge or the pyramids, uh, all these other monumental constructions, it seems there's lots of theories going around, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about how they even physically achieved these things. Uh, so it, it's terribly, how can I put it? It's, it's, it's a reflection, I think, of our short-termism and our myopia and our kind of, uh, we are the peak of evolution, you know, this idea that we think we are, that we look on previous civilizations as uh, they have to have been, inevitably, they must have been not as clever as we are. Well, I think, again, if, if you can set that aside, then you can start to look at some of these achievements and consider, well, perhaps there have been exceptional people as long as there have been people. Yes, yes, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, in the book, we, uh, we, we, we do consider this uh, for, for a short section. Um, how um, did uh, people achieve this understanding in um, prehistory when apparently there was no writing at all. Um, we consider, first of all, p perhaps alien intervention. Um, that doesn't seem to fit the bill to us. Uh, we consider um, remote viewing um, because this is something which is in evidence in the present day, although again actually rather poo-pooed in the um, in the hard edge circles of, of science, but there is uh, plenty of evidence that certain individuals can remote view. Um, and this throws, uh, um, I, I might mention Dean Radin there. Uh, Dean Radin has done a lot of work on this, and his, his evidence, which is fully scientific, is, is really conclusive um, that some people do have extraordinary powers of um, perception. Um, and it, it, it could be that what we're looking at there is just the very edge, just the very uh, shallow end of something that was available in the ancient world at a far deeper level. Um, so w 
we're using our own criteria and thinking, for instance, in terms of measurement, well, you couldn't possibly know where Mount Everest is without um, getting George Everest to, 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 to go and survey it. Um, uh, but perhaps you could. Perhaps you could know where Mount Everest is without ever using a, a surveying uh, tape in your, in your life. It, it's just a question of our own perceptions and uh, our ability to... Um, uh, to 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 see things from perhaps a, an altered perspective, which remote viewing offers. Well, you mentioned remote viewing. Now, this is something that I'm intensely interested in, and I've done actually a lot of shows on this. Uh, Dean Radin's evidence, I think, is very compelling. The military, of course, had their remote viewing program uh, for quite a while, which is kind of, well, it's more or less lampooned in the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats. But uh, there's a chap called Courtney Brown who's based over in the U.S., who runs a remote viewing operation. And I've just completed my 10th interview with him. Clearly, this is something that I think there is credence to, there is evidence for, because it's basically the idea that mind extends beyond the body and that there is a sort of a unified field underlying things mind can access, if I can put it like that. And it's just not you know, why we're here today really to discuss this. However, if people look into it, you can begin to see how down the ages and, and continuing today, although we do live under that yoke that you mentioned earlier of skepticism and um, poo-pooing anything that isn't um, hardcore materialism. But there's been the suggestion that certain individuals under certain circumstances can perceive beyond uh, their bodies and beyond the boundaries of time and space. And this is something that you know, I personally have experienced, I've, I've started to like work myself into training in remote viewing and it's, there is something here. So although it seems like if we're trying to maybe account for how ancient civilizations could have achieved some of these things and, and known some of these things that, well, isn't remote viewing a bit of a, you know, a bit of a long shot, I think it's worth looking at because Along the lines of what I was saying earlier about us assuming that ancient peoples were, you know, not as developed as we are, not as advanced, just frank, frankly, just not as clever. There do seem to be abilities that, that humans have had that have atrophied, that we have lost. And, and I don't think um, uh, by any means that we're the peak of human evolution. I think we may be at best on a bit of a plateau, if not on a bit of a trough, you know, waiting for things to pick up again. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, I... I didn't realize, Greg, that you were uh, involved with remote viewing in, uh, in such depth um, because it's a subject that fascinates uh, me because um, a lot of this uh, work, um, uh, during the course of this work, I, I became aware of um, Edgar Cayce and um, I've read everything that I can about Edgar Cayce and um, I've come to the conclusion that... Um, uh, he was doing exactly what it appears he was doing. In other words, he was capable of uh, recognizing individual ail ailments of people who were nowhere near him, and um, that he was able not only to recognize the ailment, but to offer a diagnosis. And if you look at the thousands of transcripts, thousands of uh, stenographic uh, accounts, um, uh, taken at, the, at his side when he was talking, and... Um, uh, you, you look at the detail that he goes into, uh, he, his work is, is absolutely astonishing. And when I first discovered this, I, I thought, why aren't we taught this in school? Why, you know, why is this area of human ability um, uh, so uh, denigrated and um, uh, uh, clouded with um, a, a sort of um, essentially a, an ignorant blanket? Um, something that we just don't look at. Um, because I, I, I think uh, Casey, for instance, may have had the sort of ability that was co relatively commonplace thousands of years ago. And um, if you have people with those sorts of abilities uh, thousands of years ago, the, the, um, the sky's the limit, really, in terms of um, uh, what can be achieved or what, what they could have achieved. Another interesting wrinkle in that line of thought is the possibility you know, we, we said earlier about you're using google earth there was a time obviously when at least a lot of these sites were being constructed uh taking into account uh, other you know geographical topographical features when these people could not see the earth from above 
in the way that we can today, whether it's Google, you know, the satellites or whether it's just from looking out the window in an airplane. I remember when I was quite young reading some books by Eric von Daniken and, uh, you know, he's been widely discredited, but you know, they're, they're interesting books. And certainly if you're a teenager, you'd plow through those things. One point that he came back to again and again was the, and you again referenced this, uh, at some point in, in your book, you've got, uh, sites with certain features that are, that only make sense when seen from the sky, whether it's, a uh, an illustration, you know, some sort of a symbol or a, a, a creature, you know, an animal, or just a pattern that only becomes obvious when you're however many miles up. And yeah. it's like, well, hang on a minute. What would, and that's, of course, where this whole ancient alien thing came in with Von Daniken. Uh, it must have been because of, you know, spaceships, but uh, whatever you think about that, there's still an issue here that these sites that have been created along the lines I described, they're there. And they don't make any sense unless you get an aerial photograph of them. And it's like, okay, well, maybe the the sort of psychic aspect that we're talking about, maybe that had some relevance there. Who knows? Yes, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, von Daniken um, has famously uh, suggested that the lines at Nazca, um, these long, long straight lines at Nazca were uh, possibly... Um, uh, runways for space vehicles uh if you look at the lines at nazca this is um by any sort of modern stretch of the imagination quite r r ridiculous uh because there are so many and they intersect uh each other and so on and so forth um uh the number of lines at, at nazca uh is indicative of um the uh, geometric thinking uh, of the people who who put them there they they can uh, the great majority can only be seen from above and recognized as um, straight lines. They're incredibly straight. And among the lines are um, geometric motifs as well, particularly elongated uh, triangles and uh, isosceles triangles. Um, in the book, we uh, we use Nazca as a final example, actually, of, of um, how these uh, monuments were carefully located on the planet. And Nazca is a brilliant example because there, the lines are, are are drawn on the you know the geometric thinking of straight lines as we were talking about earlier that, that is there for all to see. Uh, there was an obsession with straight lines, and if uh, you, you then ask yourself, well, why is Nazca where it is? Uh, you know, how was this location decided? Um, and it transpires that uh, uh, the Mon monument at Nazca is on a, a line joining the Amazon, the Nile, and the Ganges deltas, uh, and at the intersection of that line uh, with the Mississippi and the Mackenzie delta. So uh, it it's uh, at a point where delta lines meet, and these are uh, among the largest deltas in the world. Um, just for reference, I mentioned the pi and phi digits earlier. These are all used by the uh, people who located these monuments. At, at Nazca, this is particularly prevalent. The um, bearing from Nazca to the Amazon Delta onward to the Ganges and then uh, uh, via the Nile Delta on a, on a great circle, the bearing on that line is 61.8 degrees. The distance between the Ganges and the Nile can be measured as 3142 uh, from the center of the Nile to the following this uh, line bearing 618 degrees to the to the Ganges. So we get these 3142s and, one, and, and 618s straight away when we look at the lines uh, from Nazca. The points that are identified in this um, process are then joined independently and they produce isosceles and right angle triangles. So we get a right angle between um, the Nile, the Mackenzie, and Nazca, and between the Nile and the Mackenzie and the Ganges. Um, uh, there's more detail about this in, in, in the book, but this is not an illusion. This is actually measurable on the surface of the Earth today. These, these uh, deltas uh, appear to be geometrically um, related. Um, and uh, the site at Nazca explains how this uh, geometric relationship works by um, as soon as you recognize that uh, you're meant to be uh, drawing straight lines from the site. Um, now, the fact that you're meant to be drawing straight lines seems in evidence by the 
uh, the, the number of straight lines that, uh, that they've drawn themselves and the number of delta shapes. You mentioned uh, on several occasions now triangles, in particular isosceles triangles, but, uh, and your book actually, the illustrations are, are full of triangles, you know, uh, drawn between various points. And uh, obviously we're talking about geometry here occurring in the natural environment, but triangles seem to be particularly significant. And I don't know, again, what your thoughts are on, on, on why that might be. Uh, and also we, we briefly mentioned pyramids uh, because they're one of the unifying factors around the globe many thousands of years ago that lead us to conclude that perhaps global travel or communication certainly would have been taking place because we find pyramids all over the world. And pyramids are just one example, by the way, of repeating motifs and types of other patterns that are like, can be seen all around the world at different times. And I mentioned pyramids in this, in the triangle context, because of course pyramids made up of triangles. So, uh, the pyramid itself just seems to be an extremely special structure. Think of the, at the, at its most crude, the pyramid stage, you know, at Glastonbury, for example, that's loaded with, uh, symbolism and, and, and meaning. But, uh, I don't know. Triangles, pyramids, what, what are your thoughts on the potential significance of these? Um, yes, I think uh, the, the, the pyramid is, is a man-made mountain, so it, uh, it, it is part of this topographical geometric understanding. In a way, it encapsulates uh, what, what we've been discussing, that the alignment of um, monuments with uh, high points and so on and so forth. There are two examples, for instance, at Giza, um, the three Giza pyramids uh, present as a reflection of uh, Orion's belt. That was uh, recognized by Robert Beauval. Fairly accurate reflection of uh, the stars of Orion's belt. And the stars of Orion's belt form a near straight line, but it is actually an obtuse isosceles triangle, which is accurate to one minute of arc using the stars themselves. So... On the Giza Plateau, we have this, uh, as it were, isosceles triangle of uh, mountains, uh, the three large Giza pyramids. But the crucial point here is that the local high point, which is just to the south of the Sphinx, uh, the name escapes me, I'm afraid, but the local high point um, at Giza is equidistant from the uh, two outer pyramids. And indeed, if you draw a line between the two outer pyramids and the local high point, you get an, uh, an equilateral triangle. And this is a triangle which does not occur by chance in 10,000 occasions, um, uh, given the accuracy uh, of, of, of the triangle itself. So at Giza, we've got this... This, this immediate reference to uh, landscape and topography uh, and uh, geometry, to topography and geometry, uh, whereby the, the the pyramid builders themselves are, are producing a geometric, a highly unusual geometric shape. I say unusual in terms of random points, um, uh, such that we should recognise that this isn't random. Um, equilateral triangles between three random points just. Uh, you, you know, are, are, are one in, um, whatever, uh, 10, 15, 20,000, whatever. Um, they're so unusual that, that we can assume that this is uh, not a coincidence. So we can see the, the thinking as soon as we look at Giza from above, find the high, the local high point, uh, use the, um, high points built by the builders and bingo, there you get the isosceles and, uh, equilateral triangle. Uh, on this point again, um, the Sphinx at Giza uh, looks due east. If you follow the line due east, you, you come to the sun at the equinox. This is well known, and it's assumed that the Sphinx is looking at the sun at the equinox. Not so, uh, necessarily. It's looking over the highest mountain uh, in the region. Uh, Jebel Ataka is due east of the central pyramid, and this alignment is so precise that, again, it just um, beggars belief that this is a chance event. Um, if you look on Google Earth, you find Jebel Ataka. It's about uh, 120 kilometers from the pyramids. This is the highest point overlooking the Nile Delta from the east. How come these pyramids are so perfectly aligned with it and that the, the Sphinx is gazing directly at the summit of this mountain? Um, it's uh, it's uh, a question of perceptions. If you 
ask um, an Egyptologist or an, uh, even an academic today, of course the idea would be poo-pooed. No, they couldn't possibly have surveyed over 120 kilometers to the highest point um, in the region. Nevertheless, the evidence is staring us in the face that they did exactly that. It's this inability to jump the perceptual fence which is, which is holding us back with our understanding of um, uh, ancient history and the ancient worldview and uh, uh, we can learn an awful lot from the ancient worldview in my opinion well a big thought here um, it's barely a question at all it's uh, rather too big to be just a question and that is why what were these ancient peoples doing and we mentioned earlier we're talking about, in this context, a lot of different sites spanning thousands of years. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, but equally there's diversity here. These are different civilizations at different times. But the purpose of the sites, for example, you know, each, each one taken in its own merit. Stonehenge is a good example. They said it was ceremonial. It was um, astronomical, maybe a combination of both. And there's lots of other possibilities. But the purpose of the sites themselves is... Uh, you know, the archaeology yields some suggestive evidence, but overall, we're really not sure. Uh, what we do know is that, or what we must, you know, must take on board is that this is significant. They were not doing this for fun, or it wasn't meaningless. And as to the underlying questions of why, in terms of why it would matter that, you know, that they put a particular monument or sacred site, whatever it happens to be, at a key point between a couple of natural, naturally occurring, you know, phenomena on the landscape, uh, features. Uh, again, we, we can't know this. We can really only speculate, but I think the idea that it was, that it was without meaning, uh, or without significant meaning, I should say, is, is, is clearly nonsense. Yes. I, 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 I think that's the, um, that's the idea is that we, we do need to, uh, uh take another look. Uh, at the at the way that we look at these uh, monuments, um, the the idea that this was uh, uh, really just that these were developed for for sort of totally sort of cultish and and um, uh, nonsensical purposes, you know, for 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 running around wailing at the sunrise, um, it is, um, is 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 one that um, archaeology introduced i th i think uh, mistakenly uh, over a hundred years ago now and the assumption that we were dealing with primitive people because they were dealing with stone um is is a terrible error um that the the intelligence that the, these monuments convey is considerable and 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 it is indeed educational um when you look at it in detail I don't know very much about feng shui or how, however you pronounce it, you know, sort of arranging your items within your home uh, for sort of uh, spiritual ends, spiritual purpose. But I do, I've got a deep interest in architecture and I think that how we construct buildings, whether we're living in them or whatever purpose they have, how we orientate them, where we put them, what is close by, what is far away. I might be going out on a bit of a limb here, but in my, my gut tells me that some of these things have significance, and I don't know why, they just do. And I see a lot of our built environment at the minute thrown up uh, in arbitrary ways with little or no design, no attention paid to the materials used other than let's just make it as cheap as possible. And I think it has an effect on us, deep psychological effect. And I don't know if any of what I've just said has any relevance to how things used to be done in terms of how people built and when, where and with what. But uh, I think it's an interesting line of inquiry. I wouldn't be surprised if it turned up something significant. Yes, I, um, uh, it reminds me of the uh, Native American who, uh, who who was asked why everything had changed so much. He said, well, we, you know, we went from living in round buildings to squares, and that, you know, that was the beginning of the end, as as uh, as, as far as he was concerned. So I'm sure you've I'm, I'm sure you've got a very good point there. <laughs> well, I mean, a, a general thought here, I mean, which we've touched upon several times, really, and I can't remember which quantum physicist it was that said science advances one funeral at a time. But <laughs> <laughs> in terms of a, a, you know, of moving your research forward and 
just any of the different avenues that we we've gone down here today we're, you know we're dealing with gatekeepers and thought police who want to even stop people having an inquiry and i don't know what your experience has been over the years with your research and when you've been promoting your writing or i, I don't know if you if you ever give talks or presentations or anything but whether you feel that things are changing for the better in terms of people being uh, more open-minded you know more willing to take things on board oh yes i do yes mm. i feel very optimistic um i think um that we've got to congratulate the 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 scientists of, of the present day for their astonishing abilities and i mean putting men on the moon mind-boggling uh things uh, traveling to mars and photographing the surface and so on i mean the the, the the scientific achievements of the present day are just absolutely astonishing at the same time I think we, we, we maybe do need to say, uh, should we be adopting such a hard-nosed, hard-edge approach um, uh, to uh, the, the, the world in general? Do we, is there an alternative view that should be allowed in um, by the scientific community? Uh, in, we mentioned remote viewing is a very good example. You saw there with the, you mentioned the Stargate project um, and uh, uh, Oh, I forget the um, statistician's name now, but she said that as far as she was concerned, uh, I paraphrase, but as far as she was concerned, psychic ability had been demonstrated uh, by these viewers. Now, this was a, um, a statistician saying this. This was coming from concrete statistical evidence, and she was coming to the conclusion, Jessica Utz, I think her name is, um, she was coming to the conclusion that uh, the statistics were telling her that psychic functioning is possible. Um, now, the scientific community, is, as you mentioned with Dean Radin and others, is is rejecting this this out of hand. And uh, Dean Radin is 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 fighting um, a, a great battle against um, the intransigence uh, that he finds in his own community, uh, what he refers to as taboo. Um, when he gives lectures, he finds people uh, walking out and questioning uh, the, the, the statistics and the information that he has gathered in a scientific way. Why is this? It's because people have a preconceived notion um, about the way things are in the world. And if you interrupt that too seriously, as Dean Radin does, and, and, and I believe actually as, as this book does, um, it, it's, a, it, it's, um, it's a great challenge and not necessarily one that people want to undertake. Well, Mark, today we've been discussing, amongst other things, uh, your latest book, uh, Sacred Geometry of the Earth, the Ancient Matrix of Monuments and Mountains. That's widely available, all the usual outlets, as I like to say here. So just in closing, uh, perhaps you've got a website or websites you'd like to share with the listeners and uh, or just anything else you'd like to put out there. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um We've started a website, it's neolithiconline.com, that's neolithiconline, one word, dot com. Uh, unfortunately, it's still in um, germination, there are, there are only uh, two sections on it there at the moment. We're adding to them gradually over the coming year. But there is a section on Avebury there, which um, I hope gives um, uh, some uh, food for thought regarding the people's ability to uh, survey the landscape. Uh, I think it provides um, a very convincing evidence that uh, Avebury was not located by a bunch of numbskulls who couldn't think where to drop some stones. It was just the reverse. It was very, very cleverly and intelligently located. Um, in the book itself, the, there is a lot more on that, obviously. Splendid. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you very much, Greg. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.